see you tonight. Good to be seen, amen? Amen. Penella Davis passed away. Just pass it on to you. Uh, Penella Davis. I don't know if you, many of you may have known her. She hadn't been in the church in quite a while, but she passed away. She hadn't had good health for a while. But uh, funeral arrangements are being made. I think that she's going to be buried at a church in, in spring. I'll, I'll give you the information as I get it. And uh, So we've got, I haven't heard anything from the Martin from the Martin group yet, so we'll wait to hear from that one. So uh, I tell you, it's tough times right now. Lots of things happening. Lots of things. So no more, okay? If you're thinking about it, don't let it happen. Don't don't accept it. All right, take your Bibles out. Let's go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm going to give you some history, and then we're going to jump over to Daniel chapter 9. So uh, let's begin with just the first three verses, and then we'll kind of jump off in here if we can. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Y'all didn't like that, did you? And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Verse 4, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this evening. I pray that as we step off into this study new tonight, that God, you'll give me wisdom in how to best put this together. I, I know, Father, there's a lot of material I'd like to cover. I pray that we'll be able to cover it in a way that it'll make sense and it'll put together for us so we'll understand the importance of this book. We thank you, Father, for the history that comes through the Word of God that teaches us your sovereignty, your oversight of everything. And, uh, and now, Father, as we go into this time, just bless our hearts. Let us be open to the Word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Nehemiah, if you want to, it's hard to imagine. We, 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 we're so used to things being in chronological order. The Bible is not, especially the Old Testament, the Old Testament is not in chronological order. You understand that, don't you? Nehemiah is probably, he's going to, it's speaking of a time just before, probably one of the last books of the Old Testament, let's put it that way. Um, what happens in Nehemiah, rebuilding the Jerusalem walls, all took place just before what we call the 400 silent years while they waited on the Lord to come. There's a lot here and there's, there's a, a lot to be thought about. So let's go back and let's just think about the history so that we kind of put this together. I don't know how else to approach this, but just do it this way. God had established Israel through Saul, the first king of Israel. And uh, Saul, of course, didn't do well. He, he refused to obey God. He refused to do what God said. And God took it from him and gave it to David. David was a good king, but um, David, had, uh, David had to do a lot of battling to be able to keep things going in the right direction. When he wanted to build a temple or he wanted to build a house for God, God wouldn't let him and said that he would, uh, he would let Solomon, his son, build it. Well, David passes, and Solomon then takes over as the king, and Solomon is a poor king. And uh, according to 1 Kings chapter 11, the Lord finally comes to him and says unto him, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy, thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son." 
Well, and that's exactly what happened. After Solomon passed, his son took over and the kingdom was split in two. The northern part of the kingdom is called uh, Israel and the southern part called Judah. The northern part was led by Jeroboam and the southern part was led by Rehoboam. And uh, the northern kingdom never had a good king. Never. They never had a good king. All the time that they were in existence, never had a good king. They had sorry kings. They always were leading people off in the wrong way. They were idol worshipers and all the rest. And so the northern kingdom uh, never had a good king. And they were invaded then. God sent Assyria to invade them. And when they came in and they took the ten northern tribes, those ten northern tribes ceased to exist. Just, they were just blown out. I mean, they were just carried all over the world, basically. And uh, so the northern ten tribes, they're not in existence. As far as we know, they're called the lost ten tribes of Israel. And it's still today, I don't know what happened. don't know where they all are. They just kind of interspersed and were intermingled with all the Assyrians and all the rest. But the southern kingdom continued. For about 300 years, it continued on. Until finally, God kind of got fed up with them. And he allowed Babylon to come in and take them captive in 587 B.C. That's a, that's a key point, 587. You might just, if you haven't ever heard that number, that's a number just kind of throw in the back of your head and let it be there. That's whenever they entered into this Babylonian captivity. And the Bible talks about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And it says this, And all the vessels... Of the house, all the vessels, I'm sorry, of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and his princes, all these he, talking about uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia. Now, when you first start reading the chapter of, of Daniel, all you find about the three Hebrew children, they were given Babylonian names. Remember what their Babylonian names are? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was their, that's not their original names. That's their Babylonian names. And uh, this was under Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And he, he was the one that led them off. And, um, but God... Uh, God's plan was for them to, uh, I'm sorry, let me make sure I've got my notes here. God's ultimate plan was to get the Jews back to their land. That was his plan for the Jews. It's always been his plan it's from day one, is to make sure they have their, their proper place. But he sends them into captivity because of their disobedience. They were 70 years in the land uh, of Babylon under captivity as a result of 70 years that they, uh, that, that, that during the 400 years, boy, I know I'm throwing a bunch of numbers out there. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've already lost you. Israel's going to suffer 70 years of captivity in Babylon because they did not uphold the sabbatical years during the time of their Egyptian captivity. I just took you back to another area, but the Egyptian captivity, which was way back before. But they were supposed to keep the sabbatical year. Once every seven years, they were to keep a sabbatical year. Well, they didn't keep it. So for 70 years, God's going to put them in Babylon uh, for their inconsistency. And uh, that's going to be the 70-year captivity. Now, there's an important prophetic event that takes place right here whenever... Si mm -hmm. Too much material, too much history, too much stuff. I don't know how to get this to you. Um, give me a second. I don't want you to... I want you to... Uh, I can see this in my head, and I can't see how I'm going to tell you about it without it getting mixed up. Uh, all right. Mm. If I was preaching, it'd be great, but it's Bible. It's, it's called Bible history. I'm teaching you, and that just doesn't come easy. Um, let's see if we can kind of chronicle this and see if I can help you help help me get it to you. Israel establishes a king, and the kings don't turn out exactly right. And what happens then? The the kingdom's divided. 
like I said, Israel, of course, is the northern kingdom. Assyria takes them off. Judah now is our central theme. And, and Judah still doesn't abide by God. And God judges them because of their inconsistencies. And he sends them off into Babylon. Well, Babylon is, is where they, they receive the harshest of their, their, um, their, um, their captivity. Uh, but even while they're there, Nebuchadnezzar realizes they've got some real assets. And so these assets are these young men, uh, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like a Daniel. And he promotes them, and uh, he sees this of value. Well, in time, um, Persia and, uh, and Media, uh, the per Medes and Persians, they, they come in, and they're going to take over then uh, Babylon. And when they take over Babylon, of course, they inherit the captives of, uh, of Israel. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe then I can carry you on. All right, now then. Cyrus was a Persian king. And uh, he, he was, um, he's important because Cyrus, it's an interesting fellow, uh, Cyrus is predicted by Isaiah like 250 years before Cyrus is ever born or ever exists, Isaiah writes about Cyrus. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Isaiah 44, 28. It says, That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt build, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So Isaiah, 250 years before Cyrus ever existed, before the children of Israel ever take it into the body, it's before there was ever uh, Nebuchadnezzar, before all that, Isaiah says, there's going to be a man named Cyrus, a king, that's going to tell Israel to go back and rebuild the temple. Well, that's kind of strange because the temple hadn't even been built in. You know, it's kind of, here we go, we've got this thing. But that's part of God's prophecy, part of God's work. And how awesome it is that God's word lets us see things like that. So that's exactly what happens. In 2 Chronicles chapter, and I'm giving you these verses, just throwing them out, just want you to hear them, okay? 2 Chronicles, it talks about, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So here's God stirring up Cyrus so that Cyrus will carry out the prophecy that Isaiah had prophesied 250 years previous to this that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, the house that had been torn down by Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so this was what he was to do, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And so he releases them to go to Jerusalem. Now here's the deal. A lot of them didn't go. Some stayed in, in, in Persia. They had found a home. Daniel had found a home. He was part of the government there and he had found a home. So there were many that didn't go back, but they were those that did. They went in three groups of people. First of all, there was uh, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel uh, took the first, I'm thinking right, took the first group back and they started rebuilding the temple. And then Ezra, and we read about Ezra, we've got a book of Ezra. Ezra goes back and he takes another group of the people and they go back to help rebuild the temple and establish the worship in the temple. But in the whole time, the walls around Jerusalem haven't been built. So, although they've got the temple established, although they've got the worship established, they're, they're according to Nehemiah chapter 1, they're experiencing some really bad stuff. I don't have else to put it. They, things are not going well. Because every time they try to meet, every time they try to, to grow, every time they try to become unified, there's always those who come in and disrupt it and kind of throw it. They need the walls. They need Jerusalem to rebuild. So uh, Nehemiah, of course, is a young man, and I tell you this, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. He's never seen Jerusalem. He doesn't know anything. He, all he knows about Jerusalem is what he's been taught. He was born in Babylon. He was born there. He was raised in captivity. He doesn't know anything about anything but the captivity. And uh, because of that, 
uh, he still, though, what's interesting to me is that he has a heart for Jerusalem. He has a heart for his homeland. He has a heart to see God do something. So um, whenever he finds out things aren't going well, it says, verse 4, And it came to pass, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. He, he wept over it. He began to pray. Now, he had a great job. He was the cupbearer to uh, Artaxerxes, who was the king at this time. Artaxerxes was the king, and Artaxerxes... Oh, let me tell you about Artaxerxes. You don't know who Artaxerxes is? He was the stepson of Esther. That'll blow your mind, won't it? See, Esther was in Persia. She had uh, a Harius... Uh, 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 is that, did I say it right? Uh, say it again. Esseras, thank you. Uh, she, she became queen after Vashti was left out. And uh, I'm trying to get this off the top of my head. But she becomes the stepmother to Artaxerxes, who was the son of Esseras. Thank you. <laughs> See, we'll get this message out. If everybody will participate, we'll get this done. Amen. Everybody jump in with me. So, uh, so anyway, so this is kind of interesting. And probably, if you think about it, it's probably Esther who put it in the heart of Artaxerxes to send, when we read about Nehemiah, he'll send Nehemiah to back to build the walls in Jerusalem. And uh, so it's probably that, that she was the one that gave him the heart for rebuilding Jerusalem. Interesting when you think about it. Now, I said this morning, I want to share with you a, a portion of prophecy that concerns this very thing, what's going to about to happen. Because if you know the book of Nehemiah, what's going to happen is Nehemiah is going to be charged by uh, Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Now that's really important because it's part of the prophecy that we find in Daniel. So let's go over to Daniel chapter 9 and let's see, I'm going to walk you through this one more time and I hope I can get it right every time my numbers get all messed up in my head. So I hope I can. Daniel chapter 9. And we're looking down at verse 24. Verse 24. <clears throat> God tells the angel to go and tell Daniel the prophecy concerning these weeks, the 70 week prophecy. In verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. So what they're looking at is a, a vision that's been given to Daniel and Daniel has these 70 weeks and God is going to explain what they are. And the angel says the 70 weeks that we're looking at are 70 weeks of years. So a week is seven years, okay? So it's 70 weeks of years is 490 years. And what he's saying is, is that 490 years, what's going to happen, that's, gonna, it's, that's how much time it's going to take before God's going to finish everything, the end of time, and God will establish his kingdom here on earth. We know that as the millennial kingdom. So he's talking about the, the whole time from whatever time it starts until the end of the, the tribulation and the millennium starts and that's the kingdom, okay? So this is the, the, the time frame. So if you're standing there and I'm Daniel, and I'm going, whoa, this is pretty important information. I mean, evidently there's something big going to happen and I have a timeline. And we know Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. But according to this angel, there is a timeline. And so the angel's giving Daniel this timeline that 490 years from some point is going to be the beginning of the kingdom of God here on earth. Everything else will be finished here. Then he breaks it down. Let's go on. Verse 26. After three score and two weeks, let's see, how many weeks is that? That'd be 62 weeks of years. Is that right? The Messiah will be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. All right, let's talk about, and after three score and two weeks, 
Well, let's see, we had 70 weeks, and now we've got 62 weeks. 480, um, 483 years. Uh, that's the three score and two weeks. 483 years. And so now he's given us that this, there's a 483 year period of that 70 week period, 490 days. He says there's 483 years uh, until the Messiah comes. Well, that's good to know because now then from some starting point to, uh, for, for that amount of time, then we know exactly when the Lord's going to come. And then he says exactly what's going to happen. He says, uh, and be cut off, which means he will die. But not for himself, because he's going to die for us. And the people of the prince that shall come. Now, that prince there is the, the Antichrist. The prince of the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. That gives us a little insight into who the, where the Antichrist is coming from. Who destroyed the temple in 70 AD? Rome did. So guess where the Antichrist is going to come from? Rome. People want to look to see who's, who's the Antichrist. They're always trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. Well, one thing you can be sure of, he's going to be Roman. He's going to be Roman. He's going to have a Roman background somehow or another. Because that's what it says. He's the prince that came, uh, shall destroy the, the prince of the people, or the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city. So this is the people, Rome, and we know that they did. They destroyed the city and they destroyed the temple. And the end thereof will be flood, and to the, uh, the end of war, desolation shall be determined. So what happens is we have this, this we have a, a period of time this angel's given that says that uh, from a starting point, he hadn't given that yet, from a starting point, we can add up the years, and we'll know exactly when Jesus is coming or the Messiah is coming, and then what's going to happen is that he'll die, but when he dies, what's going to happen, they're going to destroy the temple, and, but... But that's okay because there's still another week of years somewhere there that's got to take place and then, then he'll establish his kingdom. Because that's what he says, verse 27. And he, that's talking about the prince, the antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's that last week of years. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out on the desolate. So he's talking about the Antichrist will, during that seven-week period, he'll establish a covenant, but it won't last. In the midst of that week, he's going to cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. So even though he will establish a covenant, and we know it's going to be a peace covenant with Israel, during the middle of that week, he's going to, he's going to violate the covenant, and he's going to uh, annihilate the uh, worship and the, the temple worship, and he's going to take on, of course, we read about this in in uh, Revelation, and he's going to take on the, the, the worship of God for himself. So this is what's going to happen, and God's given a timeline. It's interesting that he's told us exactly when this is going to happen. Well, when is that going to happen? Let's go back to verse 24. Is that right? Nope. Nope. 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression. That's not it. Where am I at? 25. Know therefore and understand that. Okay, thank you. From the, be, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to reveal Jerusalem. Oh, wait, there we go. Now we have a starting point. This is the starting point. The commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Not the temple, Jerusalem. Well, when's that going to take place? Oh, let's see. We go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, or actually chapter 2, and we find where the uh, King Artaxerxes gives the command. This is uh, in, uh, in the early part of 445, 446 uh, B.C. He gives a command. In fact... There's an exact date. Let me, um, let me get back to it. Y'all hang on. Say again. April 1145 B.C. Is that what you said? 445 B.C., right. Um, 
And y'all excuse me tonight because I'm trying to. Uh... And it came to pass, chapter 2, Nehemiah, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, on the 25th year of Artaxerxes, the king that wine was before me took it. It goes on down, and uh, the king sends Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And that date is the date that begins the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. Now, we, again, we're, we're in this thing where we're, we're going, okay, we've got a timeline that starts with Nehemiah's, or Artaxerxes' declaration or decree to go rebuild Jerusalem. And we can add that up and we come to exactly when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey to the very day, which is awesome. But, but then the kingdom didn't start right then. What happened? Well, there's a seven-year period that's left out. What, where's it at? Well, it hasn't taken place yet. Because as those who are the prophets of the Old Testament, they could not see what we see, what we've been involved in. They saw from the mountaintop of Daniel or the mountaintop of, of Nehemiah, they see from there into the kingdom. And they don't see this 2,000-year period that's called the church age. All they see is they just jump from one to the other. But we realize that that seven-year period hadn't taken place yet, but it will take place according to Revelation. It's going to take place at the end of time after what we call the rapture where the Lord takes the church out. And once that takes place, then what's called the tribulation takes place here on earth, divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. The first three-and-a-half-year period will be a time of peace as the, the, the Antichrist establishes that peace contract with uh, Israel and Israel begins to rebuild the temple and all the things are put in place. And, you know, it's interesting, and you've heard this, uh, in, Jerusalem, in, in Israel right now, they have, uh, laying on the ground, they have prefabricated the temple. Uh, it's ready to go up. They have argued and tried to fight to be able to put it on the Temple Mount, but they've ha had so much resistance from the Muslims. But they finally came to a place where they realized they could put it right next to the uh, Muslim mosque that's there and actually be on the, uh, the, the actual location of the temple. So they could be side by side. I don't know if that's what will happen. But they will rebuild the temple. They are also, I don't know if you know this, I read this the other day, they, are, they have started training the priests. They've started training young men on the priesthood so that whenever they establish the temple, they can begin temple worship and they, they, will, they will do sacrifice and all the things that they did in the Old Testament. And our, the, the Antichrist will allow that to happen for three and a half years, but at the end of three and a half years, he'll say, that's enough, and he'll end that, and then he'll take the throne, and he will demand that they worship him. And, uh, and then he'll go after Jerusalem, he'll go after Israel, and uh, try to destroy her as a whole. Now then, let's go back to Nehemiah, and uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, and let's just spend just a few minutes here um, talking about Nehemiah. There are three roles of Nehemiah. You're going to find as we read through this, role number one is the king's cupbearer. Then he becomes the builder, the, the, the builder of the wall of Jerusalem, and then once the wall is established, he will become the governor of the city. It's interesting to me, too, that uh, this, this young man, and I say that he must be young, I think he was probably a young man, this young man who was a cupbearer, who had served there in the, the palace of uh, Artaxerxes, had never been, as far as we know, an architect or a builder that we know of, but uh, whenever God lays it on his heart to become this builder, he's able to take on that role. And do you know that it only took them 52 days to build the walls around Jerusalem? What kind of leader is that? That is an amazing feat. No one thought they could do that, but they did. And then once it's built, he becomes the governor of the city. Well, you're talking about climbing the ladder or whatever from a cupbearer. Now, when, when you think about a cupbearer, I, in my heart, I, I, I kind of feel like that's kind of a, uh, a lowly position, you know, he's... He's, uh, he serves the wine to the, to the king. But it's a lot more than that. As a cupbearer, he had to sample all the food and drink for the king. Why? In case it was poisoned. So, so I'm going to tell you something. 
Artaxerxes loves this cupbearer, and he values him as a person because he's protecting King Artaxerxes from any kind of coup or problem that might take place. And because of that, we believe that there was probably an intimacy developed between the king and this young man. So much so as we read into the text, we're going to find that the king notices his, his demeanor. He understands there's a problem. So this, this cupbearer, he was faithful at being a cupbearer. He was, from, he was a, he was a uh, is, Israeli, he was, a, he was Israel, uh, that, that had been mis, had grown up there in Babylon, uh, but his parents were slaves to Babylon, and now he's here under the rule of Artaxerxes. Uh, and, uh, but even that, he, he takes on the responsibility with... Uh, with gravity, he understands the importance of his job. It's suggested that no one had the influence of the king as much as the cupbearer because he depended on him so much. He had an intimate counsel to the king. Nehemiah, as the cupbearer, gained the king's confidence and respect. And Nehemiah prayed for God's leadership in expressing his desire. But he let God work out the details. As we get into the text, we're going to find that, that Nehemiah, we're going to learn how that, an important fact of how to let God do the impossible. Um, one of the things about the Medes and Persians was that they never would change their laws. Once a law was established, it was called the law of the Medes and Persians, you ever heard of that? That means it's something that never changes. They just don't change it. It's always going to be the same. You can't change it. Even the king was not allowed to change it. And so when Nehemiah is trying to get the king or the thought of the king allowing him to go to Jerusalem, he realizes this is an impossible task because there had been a decree about them not being able to do that. And so uh, he's, uh, he's fighting a battle that only God can win. But it's awesome that God does win and God allows him to go back and build uh, the wall in Jerusalem. Let's look at the words. Verse 2. Um, and Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped. Now he's talking about those that are at Jerusalem, those that had left to go back and to rebuild the temple. And every time somebody came from that area, I'm sure they were anxious to find out the news. What's going on? How's things going? Is the temple established? Are they starting on the walls yet? Is there a chance that Jerusalem be rebuilt? Will we be able to go home? Is there going to be a home to go to? And like I said, for Nehemiah, who was born in Babylon, born in this area, as who said, uh, born in that area, what's his concern? Why would he desire that? Well, I'll tell you why. It goes along with the message this morning. His family had never lost their love for their country. They never lost the love for the land that God had given them. They never lost the, uh, the desire for their temple to be back and their worship to be reestablished. They never lost that desire. And they, they implanted that into their son, Nehemiah. And Nehemiah had the same kind of heart for Jerusalem that these old timers had because he loved, he wanted to see that happen as well. He was concerned for Jerusalem. Hananiah as comes as one of his brethren. It could have been even his brother, and uh, uh, literally a blood brother, if it could be. And, uh, but he comes and he asks him about what's going on. Of course, he tells him things aren't going well. The remnant that are left, our captivity there is in the province, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates there are burned. So it's, a, it's in bad repair, and Nehemiah is so concerned over this problem. So what does he do? I love this. Nehemiah takes it to the one person who can fix it, amen? See, he wasn't allowed to go before the king and display any kind of uh, negativity. It was forbidden for him to walk in and have a bad day. You know what I'm saying? That'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? You, you can't, you can come visit me, but don't you visit me if you've got a bad day. If you're having a bad day, you better stay away. Because if I'm King Artaxerxes, I can have you put to death. You walk in with a sour look on your face. You know, you, you come to the door, you put on your smiley face and come in. And you stay that way until you leave. Don't you change. 
Well, Nehemiah is burdened over this city. And so he goes to the Lord in prayer. He goes to the Lord seeking the, uh, the recourse. What am I supposed to do? And I think, I think also it's interesting that he wants to do something. You know, when there's a problem, there's three ways people approach that. One is they don't get involved. You know, that's a problem, I'll just stay away. I'm not interested, I'll just stay away. And then there's a second group that love to sit on the outside and tell the ones that are on the inside doing the work how to do the work, right? The Monday morning quarterbacks. And then there's those, those few that actually put feet to the fire. They get in there, they jump in, they get it done. And every problem we face, we find these, these are the people that are around us. You either have those who support you or those who will, will get in the ditch with you or you have those that will walk by and shake their head and walk on by. That's just the way it is. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You just got to decide what you're going to do. And Nehemiah was one of those guys, and I wonder where he got this in his character. I wonder where he gained this kind of, of, of desire to not just want to know what was going on, but wanted to be a part of the solution. And this was not an easy thing. This could cost him his life. This could, this could change everything. Here he is in this, in this nice, beautiful palace. He has a great job. He's got food. He's got clothing. He's got a place to stay. Uh, he's taken care of other than the fact that he has to drink something that might be poison. Other than that, everything seems to be pretty good, right? But he's got things going in a good direction. And why would he want to change all that to go to a place he's never been to do a job that he's never done before? Why, why would he do that? Well, the only thing I can tell you is that God laid it on his heart. And when God does that, you just have to do what God says. And he prayed. Let's look quickly into the prayer and then we'll finish up. And here's what he said. He wept and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, verse 5, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. It's interesting that he begins by acknowledging the awesomeness of God. That's a great place to begin prayer. Is put yourself in the presence of who you're talking to. Make sure you understand who you're, you're visiting with. The great and terrible God. The terrible means fearful or the one that we fear or reverence. And the, and the great and the fearful or reverence to God that keepeth covenant. He said, you're the one that knows how to do these things. And then he says, let thine ear be attentive. Listen to what I say. You know what? You don't have to worry about that. He's going to. And thine eyes open. Yeah, God knows what's going on. But he wants, he wants to attach to God. He wants God to understand his heart. He wants, to, he, wants, he wants to make sure God gets a handle on how much he wants this to happen. He, all, he obviously knows that God wants this to happen. But now he wants God to know that this is what he desires. And not just a little, semi, little simple prayer that he prays. But he prays before day and night. He doesn't just pray just ever so often. He prays all the time about this. And then notice what he prays. He confesses the sins of the children of Israel, which we've sinned against thee. You know, he wasn't a part of their sin. He wasn't there whenever they were sinning, even when they were in Israel. He was born there. But yet he confesses the sin. He understands that he's a part of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel has offended God to the point that God had put them in captivity. And he understands that. And so he prays a confessional prayer, confessing the sins of him and his father's house. All that has sinned against him. He says, verse 7, We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Well, they've been in Babylon. They couldn't. But now as they begin to open the door, but Nehemiah is praying for the past, a past that he wasn't even a part of, but yet he is a part of it because he's, he's of Israel. I remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, 
if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Man, what a promise that God had made and Nehemiah had learned and he reminds God or he, re- he doesn't have to remind God, he rehearses before God the, 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 the promise that God had made. And the promise was if they would keep the commandments, if they would walk like God wanted them to walk, that he would bring them all back together. And that's what Nehemiah sees and wants to happen. Verse 10, Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. And I, when I say that, immediately I think about the fact that he's praying, knowing there's others that feel just like he does. It's not everybody, but there are those that do. And I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, talking about Xerxes, for I was the king's cupbearer, he said. So he's praying for God's leadership and design. Whenever we're faced with those kinds of problems that only God can fix, you've got to, you've got to, you have to recognize that that's going to be done on his timetable, not ours. Uh, I've dealt with many issues, and, and I, I've, I've dealt with many people who have issues with a lot of things. And where we get in trouble is that we don't want to give God time to do the work. We, we want it to happen right now. He had heard about the problem going on in Jerusalem, and he begins to pray, and he's praying night and day. I'm telling you, he's expecting God to answer the prayer. But he also understands that he can't do anything until God does answer the prayer. And you have to be willing to wait for God to answer the prayer. Visiting with a man this morning, And he said, you know, I've been praying consistently for my family. And he said, I haven't seen God begin to move in their lives yet. And he said, I've been praying for years. And I told him, and I and I I believe this is true. You may see it in your lifetime, and you may not. But that doesn't mean you don't quit praying, because you're laying before the feet of the only one that can fix it. And Nehemiah understood that. This was the only one who could open the door for him. He's the only one that could do what needed to be done so that Nehemiah could do what he had on his heart to do. And that was to go to Jerusalem and help rebuild the the wall. There was no way anybody else could do this. This had to come from God and God alone. And we will see that in chapter 2 when we get there, how that happens. But I think it's an amazing thing whenever we, we talk about prayer, and we've, and we've really been talking about prayer a lot, seems like, lately. Uh, we talk about prayer, but m- most Christians look at prayer like it's, the, uh, it's the, the list of Santa Claus, you know? It's, it's, I'm giving God my list of things I need Him to do. But we expect Him to do it right now. We lack the patience. But Nehemiah is going to wait on God. It's going to take a little time for God to work out the details here. Or it's not going to, it's not going to take God that long to do it, but it's, God's going to require some time to work out the details. But Nehemiah is going to stay faithful. He's going to continue to pray, and that's what we've got to do. You pray, and you pray, and you pray. I told you about the little lady in Indiana. We were up there, and... Uh, Dr. Hiles was sharing a story. There was a young, there was a lady, in the, a family in the church, and the lady was married to an unsaved man. He married an un, unsaved girl, and um, or she'd gotten saved, and she began to pray that he'd get saved. And the more she would talk to him about being saved, the more obstinate he became. He wasn't going to, that wasn't, he wasn't interested in that. He didn't want a part of that. But she consistently prayed for him. Fourteen years she prayed for him. Fourteen years, and. Uh, Never failed to pray for his salvation. Never failed the opportunity to talk to him about his salvation. But every time, it's no, I'm not interested, not interested. But in that time, he'd also learned some things about God. One of the things he'd learned was about the rapture. One night, he was laying in bed, and he reached over, and he felt where her pillow was, and she wasn't there. And he thought, where in the world? What has happened? And he called her name, and she didn't answer 
And he began to think, what if the rapture's come? What if I'm left? What if, what if she's gone? What if my chance is over? What am I going to do? He got up out of bed. He began to walk through the house. And he was trying to find her. He was calling her out, and she never, she never answered. Pretty soon, he saw a light from underneath the bathroom door. Middle of the night. And he cracked the door open to look inside. And there he saw her kneeling down in front of the commode and praying, God, please save my husband. And it broke his heart, and he got saved. Fourteen years of praying before that happened. Sometimes it happens overnight. Sometimes it happens over 14 years. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. But we're just supposed to pray. And like Nehemiah in his prayer, we need to be consistent to pray and then wait on the outcome to whatever God is going to do. All right, I'm going to stop there. Is any question, comment, or thought? I'm sorry if I seemed a little discombobbled. Uh, it's not a sermon. It's teaching, and sometimes that comes a little harder. Any question? I know I've probably stirred up a lot of questions. Anybody? 490 years. 483 of them have already taken place. Seven years are still left. The seven years of the tribulation... The one week of his left. Got that? Nehemiah is going to be, he's the cupbearer, going to be a what? A builder, an architect. And then what? The governor. So we're going to see this man transition as he grows into these positions. But I'll tell you what we're going to see. We're going to see a godly man. A layman, if you will, that just wants to do God's work and uh, to be involved in God's work. And man, what an awesome fellow he is, as we all learn, and how he deals with things. He's going to deal with some real issues. He's going to deal with some characters that will make you mad. And uh, if you've never read the book, it's going to be interesting to see how you, he responds. Okay, if there's not any question, comment, or thought, then we'll stand and be dismissed to the word of prayer. Thank you for being here tonight, and hope it's been a blessing to you. Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. I pray, Father, that you'll go with us now. As we head into the week and the opportunities that you lay before us, we pray for these who've suffered the loss of loved ones this week, Lord, and whatever we can do, we pray, Lord, that we will uh, participate to help in bringing comfort to them. And then we just pray, Lord, as we start out the new year, that we'll keep uh, those promises that we've made and that we won't fail, Lord, no matter how hard they may be sometimes. And we just thank you again that you never give up on us. In Jesus' name, amen.